Hello friends, I am Dr. Balakrishnan. I am an associate professor at the National University of Advanced Legal Studies at Cochin in Kerala. I am going to present before you today for your information a module on fair trial. The concept of fair trial is a very encompassing one and what we need to be looking at is the different facets as such which includes the different aspects of fair trial. At the outset let me be very clear that the meaning and scope of this particular phrase fair trial is very very difficult to fathom because it spreads across both substantive as well as procedural laws. And normally when, when we talk about fair trial we generally start with the aspect of due process, especially because due process has been read into our constitutional scheme into articles 14 and 21 as a facet of right to life. This basically embodies all aspects of what we generally cover under the concept of rule of law, especially in a democratic society. As I mentioned earlier, when you talk about due process, it's a concept essentially coming from the United States but which has got a worldwide recognition. And when we talk about due process in the context of fair trial, what we are looking at is the aspect of preserving the public confidence in the administration of justice. And it is for this reason that we need to recognize that fair trial has a universal recognition. If you look at the aspect of uh, fair trial across the globe, there are these principles that are to be followed irrespective of the heinous nature of a crime. It's applicable to all sorts of crimes. And then it is not just enough that some facets of fair trial are satisfied while some are not. It is one of the fundamental principles of contemporary criminal law with regard to legality of offences, the non-retroactivity of criminal law and also the aspect of subjective criminal responsibility that has to be observed. On the aspect of fair trial, of course the National Human Rights Commission versus State of Gujarat in India came up with this aspect of how, observations on the aspect of how to balance the as competing interests of this fair trial in a criminal justice administration process. There are various interests that are involved. The interest of the accused stands foremost. Then there are there is this public interest which has to be satisfied as I mentioned earlier with regard to regaining or retaining the confidence of the public in the entire system. The victim has to be taken care of in the sense of feeling as to how justice has been rendered and then of course it's also necessary that those who have committed wrongs must be made answerable as such. All these and more come within the ambit of fair trial. And that is why the Supreme Court has elaborated upon how fair trial is something which has a social impact, there are social needs and there are many powerful balancing factors which will come in the way of administration of justice. If we attempt to define fair trial, it's going to be very, very difficult because there is no analytical, all comprehensive or exhaustive definition to refer to as fair trial. It has to be dealing with infinite varieties of situations and as such, what has to be kept in mind is the fact that it is something which maintains fairness to such a degree that no miscarriage of justice has resulted. I think that is what can define fair trial because in different situations it has different connotations. Not just in different situations, there are also instances where fair trial standards differ from country to country, it differs in the very same place in terms of history, it differs in terms of the legal system that is being followed, the type of government that is there, how far religion has a say in the administration of justice 
and then of course many other norms that are considered as acceptable to a society. One of the examples that you find is the European experience where this fair trial concept is considered as an intuitive concept uh, mainly because of the fact that you know European Union has so many different systems which are in place and they are so complex that it's very very difficult to have a single all pervasive concept of fair trial which is applicable. That is why the European courts have uh, taken upon themselves that each country would be held to the fair trial standards that they consider are appropriate to their system. And that's why when it comes to the adversarial system, they have set of norms and what they would be held answerable for is whether those norms have been adequately complied with. And on the other hand, when you talk about the inquisitorial system, the question would be whether the inquisitorial standards have been properly adhered to, which basically may be totally different from what the adversarial standards would be. If you look at the international documents on fair trial, it's spread across almost all the documents which we refer to as the human rights documents. Uh, we have it in the form of the ICCPR, where Article 14 refers to it. You have it in the African Charter, you have it in the American Charter um, Convention on Human Rights, you have it in the ECHR. Uh, as far as International Court of Justice, their statute refers to this. And of course, we have two instances of uh, international criminal tribunals as far as Rwanda and Yugoslavia is con are concerned where again these concepts of fair trial was also adhered to as such which more or less looks like the adversarial system to be uh, comparing it with the inquisitorial system or standards as such. There are additional documents internationally, uh, the UDHR which is of course a soft customary international law and uh, that is supposed to be something which is applicable even to those states which have not adhered to the uh, other binding documents as such. So, since it has been become part of the customary international law, it is something which can be considered as binding on all state parties or those parties who are not uh, parties to the documents which are binding. There are many other conventions internationally, Convention Against Tortures, one you have the basic um, principles on treatment of prisoners, you have the standard minimum rules for treatment of prisoners, you have uh, protection against uh, any form of detention or imprisonment. You have a basic principle for role of lawyers, you have basic principle for law, role of judges as such, independence of judiciary especially. You have uh, special rules for the administration of juvenile justice and uh, we have code of conduct for law enforcement officials, um, for prosecutors and uh, against uh, certain punishments which are arbitrary or summary as such as regards use of force and firearms in many of these uh, situations and of course uh, we have uh, very many other documents which make a reference to us as such this concept of fair trial. When we consider fair trial especially uh, in, in the particular background that we are in, we look at it from the point of view an adversarial nature of trial being a, a system having a system which has uh, its uh, roots in the common law. And in an adversarial system what we generally see is that the prosecution and defense both, both of them must be having a, an equal opportunity as such with regard to those uh, issues that are under consideration in a decision making process. Uh, there should be what is generally called as an equality of arms between the prosecution and defense and uh, in fact at one level you might even say that uh, the defense is in a better position because the prosecution has been burdened with even the requirement of disclosing uh, those materials that are uh, favorable to the defense too. So in that sense it's, it's not equal in that sense. Uh, and then uh, that's because of the reason that uh, the prosecution as such is not supposed to be looking for a conviction at all costs but then uh, to see that justice is done and that is what uh, requires them to be playing fair. Uh, the test that is generally referred to for the purpose of finding out whether fair trial has been uh, complied with is to see as to whether any prejudice has been caused uh, to the person in terms of compliance requirements, both substantive law compliance requirements as well as procedural law. And uh, again, when you talk about fair trial in terms of procedure, we must understand that uh, procedure is technicalities and all technicalities, every single deviation in terms of technicalities may not as such have a uh, detrimental effect on the fair trial concept as such. Uh, as long as there is substantial compliance in terms of uh, the law, uh, small mistakes in procedure, in terms of uh, how when the errors are inconsequential etc omissions well of course as long as uh, prejudice especially substantial prejudice has not been caused that might not be treated as something which vitiates the entire process. 
And that is why when you are talking about judging the question of prejudice, uh, the courts must be acting with a broad vision and they must look into the substance as what is said, not just the technicalities. And uh, whether the accused has received a substantial fair trial is what the court's assessment should be. But then this is not losing the sight of the fact that procedure, of course, is a handmade procedure, is something which ensures that rule of law sustains. It is something which ensures that the whims and fancies don't have their say in the entire process. Uh, as far as prejudice is concerned, it's very difficult for you or me to give a particular definition to that, give it a particular interpretation as such in criminal jurisprudence. And that is why it has to be seen in terms of what has happened right from the initial stages to the ultimate stage, how that has affected uh, the party's interest, especially the accused's interest as such uh, in terms of getting a fair trial. Once the accused is able to show that there is serious prejudice, um, be it of the uh, substantive law or the procedural law, and then he can of course seek a benefit saying that the fair trial standards have not been met. Uh, it may not be possible for us to say with exactitude as to what these uh, standards could be. It has to depend on the facts and circumstances of each case. Probably we can look at some of those uh, elements that are to be ensured to have a fair trial satisfaction. Equality before the law of all parties is one such thing and when we discuss parties to a uh, criminal justice administration process, we are not just talking about the accused, we are talking about everybody having an access to courts, having access to tribunals, having access to the criminal justice administration system. And when we talk about uh, prejudice again, we are not talking about prejudice against the accused alone, but that must be that must be understood as something which is to be assessed in terms of weaknesses, in terms of victims, along with what could be the interest of the accused. One another facet of fair trial is the right to have your dispute heard by a competent, independent and impartial tribunal. Now when we talk about an, a competent tribunal, we are talking about a tribunal which has the capacity to come up with a binding decision. And these judges and wherever juries are there, we don't have them as of now, but for those systems where juries are there, both the judges as well as juries must be independent and impartial. Now it's not just the courts of law that you are talking about in terms of required requirement to comply with the federal standards, but then it is also required for military tribunals, religious courts, some countries have religious courts and there are some countries where traditional courts are there. For example, the African Charter makes a specific reference to traditional courts also uh, being asked to comply with the fair trial standards as such. And this standard is something that has to be adhered to right from the inception to the aspect of final decision. One another aspect that must be kept in mind is with regard to how during a trial there should not be any unnecessary interference. Now this unnecessary interference is something which may impact the prosecution side, which may impact the public interest or which may impact the accused. We generally hear about it in terms of what impact it has on the accused, but then there are different uh, various other effects also that it might have. When we talk about uh, impartiality, that again uh, requires a, a, a kind of ba balancing that has to be done between what we have as the accused right to get a, a fair trial, the victim's right to ensure that a trial is fair to get him justice, the witnesses having a fair uh, role to be played in the entire process and in all these cases one of the major debates has been with regard to media access to trials uh, whether that affects the impartiality or the independence of the decision making process and that has been a debated uh, subject as such. The right of the accused in a fair trial by an independent and impartial tribunal is unqualified and that is why sometimes media is something which has to be brought within certain limits as far as their rights are concerned in deciding whether fi fair trial standards would be violated or not. But then this is also something which has to be understood in the context of a public hearing which again is a facet of fair trial. A public hearing requires that the entire process is open to the public scrutiny which ensures that fairness is, is there right from the beginning till the end. And the presence of media to that extent ensures that kind of transparency being communicated to the public at large as such. And that is why there are different standards that are to be applied in assessing as to whether a public hearing has to be 
ensured at all cost or there are instances where a public hearing may be deviated from and that has to be on the basis of principles of necessity and proportionality that we talk about in terms of deciding uh, when a public hearing as such may be avoided. There are different grounds that may be um, insisted upon for uh, avoiding a public hearing. They may be in terms of morals, in terms of public order, in terms of national security, in terms of private lives of parties, privacy as such. And of course, public interest may sometimes require that proceedings are conducted in camera in certain circumstances. And uh, publicity as such may be detrimental, as I mentioned earlier, to different parties who are there. Another facet of fair trial is the presumption of innocence. And when we talk about presumption of innocence in a criminal justice administration, of course, we are talking about the burden of proof being there on the state to prove the case and the standard being such that it has to prove it beyond all reasonable doubt. And the accused is entitled to all kinds of fairness in, in terms of both investigation as well as trial and uh, the conviction, post-conviction stages too. And it should be conducted, the entire process must be conducted in a manner which balances the rights of the citizen under Articles 19 and 21 of the Constitution on the one hand and as to how the state's police power is there to ensure the maintenance of administration as such. Another facet would be privilege against self-incrimination, a constitutional right as such as we all know and this can extend to the testimony of the accused in the court in terms of com compelling him to produce evidences allowing uh, evidences to be collected, material evidences to be collected, uh, legal compulsions to answer questions, uh, inferences, especially adverse inferences being drawn uh, from his uh, silence. There may be coercions of different kinds, including uh, psychological coercion as such to answer questions and uh, confessing guilt, etc. All these are in terms of uh, self-incrimination violations as such. The reliability of scientific evidence has been in the news off and on. Uh, in terms of uh, whether that can be used and how far it can be used and if at all it is used, uh, what is its evidentiary value, to which stage of the entire proceedings must it, be, must it be confined and what safeguards must be in place in order to ensure that the fair trial rights of the accused are not violated as such. The constitutional rights as such must be put at a pedestal which is much higher than when uh, the other rights that a uh, particular accused may have in terms of statutory provision. The equality of arms as such as mentioned earlier is something which ensures minimum guarantees uh, especially for the accused that he be informed of the particular accusations that are against him so that he can put up an effective defense. It is also necessary that the charges must be specific against him. It requires procedural equality as such in terms of presenting one's case, in terms of uh, maintaining the adversarial nature of the proceedings, in terms of uh, being able to instruct his uh, counsel, having a counsel first of all, instructing him effectively and having adequate time and facilities to come up with a proper uh, defense uh, preparation as such. And uh, basically when we talk about the right of counsel, you must understand that the right of counsel is an effective uh, counsel that we talk about. And this assistance of legal counsel is something which is of uh, paramount importance uh, for us to uphold the rule of law. And uh, this counsel, as I said earlier, must be competent one and uh, where the particular person is unable to come up with a counsel of his own, of course, the state is obligated, constitutionally speaking, to provide him with a particular counsel which will ensure that the fair trial standards are adhered to. Speedy trial has been repeatedly considered as an aspect of fair trial. Uh, Hearing without undue delay is a facet of fair trial. But then we must remember that a delayed trial is not necessarily always an unfair trial, especially where the reasons as such are there for any delay as such and whether the question should be whether any prejudice has been caused to the accused as such. Uh, a speedy trial is not just in the interest of the accused, it's also in the interest of the uh, society as such to get a uh, a dispute settled as early as possible. This flows from Article 21 again and of course this spreads across all stages, investigation, inquiry, trial, uh, revision, retrial, everything is included within this concept of speedy trial as such. And the courts are as and when required to make a balancing test, balancing act in terms of finding out whether speedy trial requirements have been complied with or not. Right to be heard is something which gives the opportunity to the accused. Uh, to bring his view, his version to the court. As such, this is closely related to defend oneself. 
uh, it may be even through self-representation or it may be through the counsel of one's choice and uh, it also includes the ability of the defendant or the accused in our language to be able to call and examine witnesses including expert witnesses and those witnesses to come and give evidence that in a free and fair environment as such. The accused also should have a right to cross-examine. Two parties who are generally not considered very prominently till late times were the victims and the witnesses. Of late, of course, we have understood the importance of both these parties uh, and this fair trial requirement also have these parties as people whose interests are to be taken care of. The, we need effective protection and participation of the witnesses as well as the victims. The witnesses especially should not be subjected to intimidation. We have uh, case laws that have come recently in terms of witnesses protection as such that is required. That has also been one of the subjects discussed in the various expert committee reports as such. Uh, apart from this aspect, we also have the aspect of victims access to justice, assistance and fair treatment including the remedy of restitution or compensation as such which can come within the concept of fair trial. We have the concepts of legality, uh, the principles of legality which are required to be adhered to including double jeopardy, uh, ex post facto laws and then of course the fact as to how uh, severe penalty cannot be imposed on a crime as such if the penalty prescription has changed uh, later to the commission of the act which amounts to the crime. However, the lenient version if it comes at a later point in time can be given that balance that uh, benefit can be given to the party who has committed the act which constitutes a crime. Consistency in sentencing and also the consideration of mitigating and aggravating circumstances are something which have to be absorbed into the criminal justice administration process in order to ensure fairness. Post conviction the punishment or the treatment that is given should not be cruel, inhuman or degrading and it is the duty of the court to uphold the due process whenever a statute prima facie looks like invading the same. And what we find is that there is a right even to the public to have a recent and timely judgment. Everyone convicted of a crime shall have the right to his conviction and sentence being reviewed by a higher tribunal according to law and that review must be a genuine review. What was mentioned till now are the different aspects of fair trial. What we must understand is that this concept of fair trial permeates all layers of criminal justice system and it requires compliance by everyone who is involved in the process and that involves every single participant in ensuring that the criminal justice standards are uh, retained, are retained for the sake of the majesty of law and the rule of law and that system which ensures this majesty of law, this rule of law is what commands respect and orderliness in the society and that is why we need to understand that fair trial standards are necessary not just for the accused as such but the entire society as a whole. As far as the accused is concerned, we must understand that he is entitled to a fair trial but then he may not exactly get a perfect one according to his choice because there are so many other participants whose interests are supposed to be kept in mind. I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Thank you.